Okay, so the title of the talk is on retro causality, time irreversibility. Now, this time irreversibility is something which is uh, in conflict with retro causality, but it is a uh, one of the most uh, important observations we have of our daily lives. Then we have advanced waves which occur in solution of electromagnetic equations. The EPR paradox of quantum mechanics. EPR stands for Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, three individuals who in 1937 uh, formulated this paradox. And there's a host of paradoxes of the sun. Now, we got a bulb over here, it gives some light. We don't see any light going towards the bulb, which are the advanced waves. But sun is a huge bulb right out there in the outer space. So it's different from a bulb inside this room. So we'll discuss some paradoxes of the sun and then apply Oakham's razor to all these different concepts. Okay, so here we have the arrows of time. Physics just does not have a single arrow, but there are a number of arrows in different phenomena. Uh, you have the electromagnetic arrow of time. The retarded waves are the waves which are outgoing from a source. But the field equation, it also gives waves which are incoming to the solution. Those are the advanced waves which are not observed. So uh, here is the first arrow that only the retarded waves are physical. Then of course, we are all familiar with the thermodynamic arrow that the entropy is increasing. Things go from old to from new to old. Then you have the quantum well, uh, I have a question. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, as I observe uh, the universe, I see it going from high order, low order to high order. That is, uh, we have a early hydrogen universe, homogeneous. So, if you know the order in one location, you know the order in another. And even in one location in the hydrogen universe, it was chaotic noise. So yeah. not a lot of um, emergent information. And then as time goes on, we develop a universe uh, with increasing complexity and emergent order. Yeah. And when we, um, but yet when we listen to ordinary explanations of thermodynamic, we're focused on, <clears throat> on local a uh, closed system thermodynamics such as a gas in a box that moves in the opposite direction. It moves from high order <clears throat> to uh, <clears throat> homogeneous <clears throat> uh, low order. But that doesn't appear to be the way <clears throat> the universe works. You know, now we have 81 stable elements, which is a higher state of order than the hydrogen universe. And before the hydrogen universe, it was a simpler quark gluon plasma. Yeah. And now the 81 stable elements self-organize into biospheres, <clears throat> DNA, cities. It just keeps going with higher order with lower entropy. So I just want to say that this still bothers me as to get a satisfying solution to, yeah. s to this, um, these, this, these different uh, viewpoints. Uh, you made a very good point, Lee. And uh, the best I can do to answer that is... Uh, evoke the concept of what's called Maxwell's demon. You heard of it? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, uh, Maxwell's demon? Maxwell's demon is a thought experiment in a, in a, Can I make by Maxwell. Small drawing somewhere. So you have gas molecules of gas, say, of this color. And you have molecules of gas B of this color. So initially, you have the barrier, and there's a stage of high entropy. And then we make a small hole in the barrier. And the particles, they start diffusing, going here into this side, and the blue ones this side. And then after some time, it homogenizes. Gas A and the B, they have totally mixed up. And now the question is, can we reach back to the stage of low entropy which was there earlier? So the concept of Maxwell demons is that there's an intelligent creature who's able to influence microscopic events at a very low energy. 
and he is capable of perception and action. So, when he say sees a let us say a molecule of gas B approaching, he has got a small door, he closes the door and this molecule goes back into that place, into that chamber and when he sees a molecule of the same gas coming from the other side, he opens the door and the molecule goes to the other side. Same thing he does for molecules of the gas A. So, <clears throat> over a period of time, Maxwell's demon Maxwell's demon is able to separate the gas A and B again. Now, this is action of a intelligence acting on the thermodynamic system. Yeah, and Amoni, I think a lot of times the experiment is also explained where in compartment A and B you have high entropy, so that in A you have black and red uh, particles, in B you have black and red particles, and then because of Maxwell's demon, which is the chooser at the, at the hole, the door, he, the system can evolve toward uh, low entropy uh, and yeah. That's a point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah, the, but the idea is that the demo need to over energy from somewhere to make the decision. Yeah. Right. Uh, there were papers on physical review letters on this topic, and one of the counter paper, as Marcelo just mentioned, it was that only how much energy will the demon require to open and close the gate. Mm -hmm. So the argument by the authors was that a gate can be made as light as possible. It just has to open and close, so the energy required can be made as little as possible. Um, and so one of the unresolved controversies in the theory of entropy is gravity. So the theory of entropy was not uh, written to incorporate gravity, and gravity is a self-organizing um, principle of the universe. So the reason we have 81 stable elements, which is more organized than just quarks and gluons is actually directly because of gravity, right? Gravity creates the, you know, suns, which create the emission of uh, heavy elements. And gravity is also in part responsible for biospheres and DNA and self-organization. So I was reading an article that um, it's, there is no strong evidence that the theory of but the classic 150 year old theory of entropy holds up when you incorporate gravity. Like nobody's dealt with that in a convincing, very rigorous way. Okay. Uh, then we have the quantum mechanical arrow of time. The quantum mechanics, if uh, the system is not disturbed, it evolves unitarily and it has time asymmetry, time symmetry, sorry. Uh, but when we introduce the concept of measurement, when we uh, measure a superposed state, then the wave function collapses to one of the eigenvalues. And that gives the quantum mechanics measurement process a arrow. <coughs> then we have the gravitational arrow of time, the formation of black holes. Now, that is a irreversible process. Even the formation of stars, which Cleese was just mentioning, that is also an irreversible process. Uh, of course, we have uh, situations like supernova explosions, and we have stars turning into red giants. But uh, there is a irreversibility in whole of the situation. We don't find supernovas collapsing back into uh, blue stars or red giants uh, becoming smaller and turn into yellow stars. <coughs> That's the fourth arrow. Then we have the fifth arrow of expansion of universe. We have the redshift of distant galaxies. We have the cosmic microwave background, and we have uh, the percentage of helium and hydrogen and other elements present in the universe, which all support the cosmological expansion of the universe that it started with the Big Bang and has been expanding since then. <clears throat> there were a couple of papers by Hawking and a 
supporting paper by page in the physical review side by side. So Hawking asked the question uh, whether the entropy of universe will decrease if it starts uh, recollapsing. It starts collapsing back again. The expanding FRW universe with S3 topology, it is supposed to reach a stage of maximal expansion and then start contracting again. So Hawking's question was, if that happens, will the entropy of the universe starts decreasing? So Don Page in a accompanying paper, he said that while it is collapsing, no doubt, but the way the quantum states are evolving, the quantum states will continue to evolve in such a way that the entropy keeps increasing. So there were these two conflicting views. Then there's certain arrows in the particle physics. For example, K0, K0 bar system, and there are other systems also which are not fully understood. Uh, but in the particle physics, in the particle interactions also, there are certain arrows of time, there are certain, certain interactions uh, which are not time reversible. And of course, we have our own psychological arrow of time. We remember things only of our past. We have no idea of the future at all. There are some people who have no idea of future, but most of us, we do not have. Okay, so we have retro causality. Now we look, look at the issue as a, in terms of uh, the concept, uh, basic concepts of mathematics of set theory. We have three types of relationships, which we call reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And if a set, the elements of the set have these three relationships, we say that uh, we have a case of equivalence relationship. Now, retrocausality, C be the causal relationship between events A and B, written as A, C, B. That is, A causes B. So, retrocausality requires this causal relationship to be symmetric, i.e., if A causes B, then B causes A, and we write it as A, C, B, then B, C, A. Now, whether we have A, C, A, that is reflexive, or whether we have ACB, then BCA, the symmetry. There's also the third possibility, transitivity, which normally we can presume that if ACB and BCC, then ACC, that if A causes B and B causes C, we can assume that A causes C. So this transitivity can usually be assumed uh, in the setup. Okay, so here we have possible topologies of time. Time can be infinite straight line, open in past and open in future. And the examples are the simplest one being Newtonian universe with infinite past and infinite future. The Minkowski universe of special relativity, which is both infinite in spatial directions as well as infinite in past and future. And we have the Einstein cylinder in which the spatial factor is having S3 topology and time factor is having R1 topology. This was Einstein's favorite universe and it has run into certain, this was static universe. This was not expanding S3. It was static universe. Later on they found that uh, while it was static, it had instabilities in the sense that if there was a perturbation of the universe, of the curvature anywhere, that perturbation would grow and the universe will start behaving differently. The stability was not there. But in any case, this is an example of uh, such a time. Can you explain the Einstein cylinder? Because I know about the Einstein cone, yeah. but I don't know about the Einstein cylinder. Einstein cylinder S3, uh, it's the equation of the basically in four dimension R square, S3 as embedded in R4. And so S3 I didn't know is a cylinder normally. No, no, no. Oh, no. no. What Times I mean R1. is we take Times the product the with R1. So S3 cross R1. Okay, so then it becomes a cylinder because it's yeah. times R1. It's a higher dimensional yeah. cylinder. Okay. It's not so S3. Extrusion. Okay. R. Thanks. So then we have topologies in which the time is bound in past and open in future. 
uh, the FRW universe with H3 topology, the open space that has starts with a finite time in past, but it continues expanding into future non-stop. So we have the second topology of time. Then we have another topology in which there is an infinite past, but there is a point at which uh, the universe stops existing and comes to a standstill. Then we have the segment of time. This is the FRW universe which has started with a singularity, reaches a maximum, collapses back right into a singularity. So the total time is finite, it is a segment of time. Mona, you said infinite past. Do you, did you mean infinite future? Uh, before this one, you said infinite this past. One? So uh, infinite past? Yeah, infinite past, but uh, ending with a singularity. Oh, so finite past. No, past is infinite. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you can think of it as a time reversal of uh, this geometry. So that's infinite future. Yeah. And then and an infinite past. But to yeah. have an infinite past, you would have to have something before the Big Bang, correct? Because the Big Bang model would implies a uh, finite past. Uh, right. So actually, this is uh, the Big Bang uh, model. It goes into uh, we have the open spatial topology, either R three or H three. Uh, H three being the hyperbolic space. So this particular arrow, it says we had a hyperbolic space which was infinite and it started contracting and finally it ended in a crunch. And on the what? It uh, uh, ended in a crunch. It's a famous model that says that there's a fight between the repulsive forces of electromagnetism and the attractive forces of gravity. And at this point, the repulsive forces of the Big Bang energy are winning and space is going out. But then at a certain point, it's going to go and it's going to reverse into the big crunch, like breathing, and it'll come back but that's down. that's the future. In the future, and it, will, and it will end in a singularity, which is called the big crunch. So, that's so we just uh, put a cut over there. We put a right. cut over there and we just consider the part of the, when it is contracting, just that part, the part which is contracting and it uh, ends with a crunch. But in the big crunch, pe the people who believe in the big crunch calculation or model say that currently we're in the expansion phase of the big crunch and that in the future it'll go and it'll go reverse until it goes back to this to the singularity like the big bang in reverse yeah. so and like nothing here didn't he said that the black hole white hole kind of thing like going out and going in yeah, yeah the white Japan holes are considered also, time reverse yeah. black holes hmm? white hole it's hmm. for japan road hmm. okay. so cyclic uh, a book about that. So this matches the Vedanta view that speaks of some notion of the cycles of breathing of the universe, right? The big crunch. And so after the big crunch, then something can happen again, and there's another big bang, and then a big crunch, and a breathing. Yeah. Uh, so here, at finally, we have what I call, and which I love, not passionately, the cyclic topology of time. Uh, Siegel was a mathematician at uh, MIT and he liked uh, Einstein's model with S3 topology, static S3 not expanding. Uh, but uh, there were problems with Einstein's universe. So he adopted a S1 topology for time. He replaced the R1 by S1. Now this is the S1 topology of time. Now, when we give time a topology, uh, it becomes a statement on events and chain of events and causality. Uh, that I'll show in the other slides. Uh, one slide just before that, uh, the group structure of irreversible S1 time. We have uh, the well-known no others theorem, which relates group structures uh, with conservation laws. For example, uh, the, if time has a group structure, 
it relates to energy conservation. Then uh, angular momentum conservation is related to the group of rotations and the linear momentum conservation is related to group of translations. So, <coughs> we need a group structure for time and on the other hand, we have irreversibility of time. So, how do we have a group structure of time? A group structure means that for every, uh, I will use the word translation in time from going from say event time instant T1 to time instant T2 to this translation, there should be a reverse translation from T2 to T1. That is the definition of group. It has to have an identity, it has to have a closure, the product A into B is equal to C should be another element and each element should have a inverse element. So, if we have irreversible time, then where is the inverse element for a time translation? And if it is not there, then we do not have the group structure. And if we do not have the group structure, what happens to the energy conservation, which comes from the no either's theorem. Now, on the other hand, irreversible S1 time and temporal translation has an inverse corresponding to rotation over the remaining period. That I will show you in the next figure. Morning, Ken. Um, so, is it, is it true that groups, symmetry groups can correspond to polytopes? For example, you can have the symmetry group S3, which can relate to a class of polytopes that have icosahedral symmetry. So, with this symmetry that you speak of, could it relate to geometry, poly, uh, well, polytopes? Uh, well, we do have uh, higher dimensional groups, uh, but I am not aware of anyone associating conservation laws with each of those groups. And I think you raised a good point, there should be conservation laws related to all these groups. I think some people have done it, but they are not. I think people have done conservation laws related to geometry. In other words, people have related symmetries that have been used in physical equations to geometric analogs. Do you do you know of any of? So you you are speaking about the discrete groups of a finite transformation of a polytope. So there is other topological model like the Poincaré dodecahedral. Yeah. where you have periodicity in the model itself, then you will have some discrete groups uh, okay. similar to the group who make a no -eter conservation. So and the discrete group can be, a, can be interpreted as a polygon, I mean a polytope. Poly polytope, yes, yes. the point Poincaré is with the dodecahedron. Okay. Okay. So the S one you will call it the irreversible. The S1 uh, should be reversible. Right? Uh, so, I'm, this is the sort of contradiction which I am uh, trying to create that on one hand we need a group structure, we need a group structure. If you, uh, yes, the next line. Uh, Let us say we have linear time going like this, we have event A, B, C on the linear time and going till x, y, z. Let us say this is the starting event and this is the ending event. So, <coughs> for B to C, causality from B to C, there should be an inverse element from C to B. But <coughs> the irreversibility is saying that you cannot have even from C to B. That is the irreversibility constraint. Irreversibility is putting a constraint on the inverse element. But I saw that you said that in the previous page the R1 is the irreversible time, but the S1 should be reversible, like just the previous one. Uh, uh, so, but you, you, you're labeling those both as irreversible. Maybe I thought that was a typo or something. Uh, a previous page. Yes, yeah, so you said that oh, yeah. the irreversible R1 time, right? That's fine. Then I said on the other hand, in irreversible S1 time, shouldn't that be reversible S1 time? No, uh, it could be, the arrow could be cycle in only yeah. one direction and because it's periodic, goes back to the yeah, past. Yeah, but then he said that each temporal translation has an inverse. 
Yes, wow. the inverse yeah. is going to the future to go periodically to the same. If, if it takes a hundred years to repeat and you want to go mm -hmm. back one year. So by, by the direction is irreversible. Right. The local, locally it's irreversible, yeah. but globally yeah. you make a turn and you are just in your past. Right. So, 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 so but that's still the re but so that's still no retro concept, no re Okay. Fine. Mm -hmm. I think it's like if, if it takes a hundred years to repeat and you wanted to go back one year, you can't like reverse rewind. You have to mm -hmm. wait you ninety nine years. You have to go to the future and yeah. then comes back. You gotta wait ninety nine years and you'll be back one year ago. Well, but that makes everything finite. Yeah. I mean, there you can literally go to the end of the future, almost, although yeah. there is no end, but then comes exactly back to that moment. Yeah. Which is well, there's kind of a reverse there's, element. It just takes yeah. There's years. kind of an end actually in the big crunch to the future, and that's the phase transition when it goes from expansion and then starts going that that mm -hmm. when you model time is with you know with it, it, inflation of the universe or expansion. Yeah, I'm just saying like if you literally go to the future and keep on going and then back to that position, is that still really the past? It's <laughs> it's weird. Or it's weird. Is it the same? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, wow. but mathematically the idea is that even if locally the time is irreversible, we you will globally have structure. a group because you can go to the other point. Okay. You can go in, so each translation, each time translation, have an inverse. Yeah. So mathematically, this is totally simple and correct. But to interpret this as something real, you you are true. If you make a circle of all this time. Are, are we still exactly at the same place? Because yeah. we have also uh, quantum mechanics, so uh, yeah. nothing is totally de deterministic. Yeah. So maybe it's not the same. Yeah. So it's in the it's valid in a classical view, not in a quantum view. Right. Uh, so here, quantum of uh, classically, we are trying to generate retrocausality mm -hmm. at a cosmological scale. The uh, I should tell you about uh, what is called as asymmetric distance in uh, certain, you have distance between two points x and y, dx, y. Generally, the distance between y and x is taken to be the same. Uh, in the asymmetric distance, the distance between y and x is supposed to be different. Now. <coughs> So, what that means is, a non symmetric distance. <clears throat> so, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if he, when he says the retro causality, it's like if you want to the future to influence the past, you can't influence this way, you have to go all the way there to influence it? Yeah, exactly. Oh, That's okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, so, this uh, idea. In, uh, asymmetric distance. I searched the internet. I could hardly find any papers on it, but it was, it is there, and it is applied in what is called as traveling salesman problem. Let's say we have a salesman who has got to visit different cities. So for him, distance from this point to this point is just this much, but distance from this point to this much, he is going to go all over these other cities and come back. So for the traveling salesman problem, uh, the distance becomes asymmetric. Oh, yes. so it happens when we have an arrow. Okay. It's a distance in an oriented graph. Okay. Yes. Uh, if it's so basically, if you want to influence the, uh, the far past, it's easy because the past is shorter. If you want to influence the most the nearest the past, you have to go all the way back there. It's even harder. Yeah, but if you have no way of going to yesterday, we really, we really can't visit yesterday. How do we go to yesterday? We can go from this point to the car over there and walk back here, but we can't visit even the last hour. But there is an experiment that does um, influence yesterday, and that's the quantum, the double quantum eraser experiment yeah. that was first contemplated by uh, by Wheeler, and then. When he died, it was not experimentally demonstrated, and then after he died, we had the technology to to yeah. do this. But experiment. did you understand my point? Oh yeah, I do. It should be easier to influence yeah, the most nearest past. Yeah. 
yeah, taking right. this taking this model, then that's a, that would be a, a logical statement. Yes, but this, this is the other way to go against the irreversible time is to use quantum phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, there could be both possibilities also. We could have the to a certain extent, as Ray was explaining to me, that uh, you, you mostly you have uh, the present influencing the past. But there could be little amount of events, few set of events in which past influences the present. Uh, that could be a possibility, it could be true also. Aside from that, the global causality through the circle, that also may be true. Both might be happening in the universe. Uh, so here you have essentially figured it out, uh, causality as an equivalence relationship in 0 plus 1d time. By 0, I mean just one point. Imagine that there's just one spatial point, and you just have time over it. So as the time passes, events you label as A, B, C, X, Y, Z. We say A causes B, B causes C, X causes Y, Y causes Z. Now event A is causeless. There's no cause for it. Event Z is effectless. There's no effect. In between events, they have a cause as well as effect. <coughs> so, over a linear time segment, A is causeless, Z is effectless, as I just said. Transitivity holds. If A causes B, B causes C, we all have A causes C. So, transitivity is, is there, but symmetry is not there. We can't say if A causes B, B causes C. The symmetry goes. And the reflexivity. A causes A, or let's say B causes B, reflexivity is also not there. But if you make the time circular, all these three things, three relationships, they hold. We have, as Fang just pointed out, A goes, causes B, B causes C, and you go all the way around it, you say X causes Y, Y causes Z, Z causes A. So we end up with saying A causes A. So that is reflexivity. And if A causes B, B causes A all the way around the circle, B causes A. So that's uh, symmetry. And of course, transitivity holds in both cases. So when these three relationships hold, it becomes what is called as equivalence relationship for that set, in the sense that all uh, space-time events, they become equivalent. So this example is just on a single spatial point with a circular time. But our space is three-dimensional. So how do we extend this argument to three dimensions? So that we do via light cones, these. But before that, I'll go through a couple of slides more. Uh, this probably is a new term, Zoll-free metric. Uh, this was developed by, again, a MIT mathematician by name Victor Gulliman, who was a student of Siegel, of the Siegel universe. So a Lorentzian manifold is said to possess Zolfi metric if all its null geodesics are closed. Null geodesics means the light rays. And he is basically talking about closed topologies, S2 cross S1, S2 spatial sphere, S1 time, S3 cross S1, three dimensions. P2 cross S1, P2 projective space, P3 cross S1. In general, uh, any Sn cross S1 or any Pn cross S1 will be example of uh, the Zolfi metric. Uh, uh, if I can add a precision, uh, because I'm speaking German. <laughs> so it's a Zolfi, and uh, literally in English, it's a bounder free. Boundary free. Free. Boundary free, free, which is exactly the definition. Zolfi? Without boundary. Oh, right. so Zolfi in German? Zolfi, yes. Zolfi is boundary. Zolfrei. When you go from uh, at the um. boundary of Germany, it's named Zol. <laughs> I was wondering what that meant. Thank you. Thanks. So it's not my name. No, no. It no, means no, it's, it's a German name. word that means bound, no boundary. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, oh, oh, I thought. Yeah, I thought it was somebody's name too. <laughs> oh, thanks. That was new to me. So a precursor for that is Zoll metric. Zoll metric concept came almost 80 years before uh, Zoll Fry 
metric concept came. So, so the difference between the two is this is for Euclidean geometries, while this is for geometries in space time, the general relativistic geometries. Yeah, projective space. That is also close. You get it by identifying the antipodal points of the spheres. All right. uh, so then, uh, how do we get S three cross S one? It is from the conformal compactification of Minkowski. The circle and the line over here, the sphere S two and plane R two over here. Similarly, mapping from R three to S three. So, uh, uh, Ray, doesn't that remind you of the talk by the gentleman who visited us hmm? of the rolling? The rolling sphere, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, right. You can roll the sphere on the plane, and uh, somebody gave us a presentation of a, a model that is based on these discrete rolling pathways. Derek Weiss, yes. Derek Weiss, yes. That's a, that, that I was attracted to a Russian paper on rolling of the three sphere, uh -huh. which is 600 cell also. Yeah, yeah. For the, um, <coughs> you know, the, including the 240 uh -huh. polytope uh -huh. and all that. Uh, are you sure this, it's not the name of a person? Zolfri? Yeah. Because so it's... Uh, it's all means boundaries. So it's a no, the name of a, a surface. I mean, I mean the word uh, free. Person that it described this. Maybe, but it, it's I'm too much. Sure of a, yes. <laughs> maybe, but it's too much of a coincidence because mm -hmm. Zol is boundary free is free. But so yeah. it's not name of a person. Also. So? Yeah. That we stood this kind of problem. Oh. Yeah, black so? or black yeah. can be a name yeah. also. It can. Yeah. So maybe. <laughs> That'd be a great coincidence. <laughs> Mr. Black discovered black hole. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Okay. So now we are moving into three plus one D. The previous examples for for just zero plus one D point and circle or line. Now in three D we have light cones. We have a pseudo Euclidean or pseudo Riemannian structure. So the cause and effect it has to go through light rays and through the light cones. So here I have two points x and y, which are lying on a space-like hypersurface. No light-like signal can go from x to y. Uh, so the notation v plus x stands for future light cone of x. V minus x stands for past light cone of x. Similarly, past light cone of y, future light cone of y. Then we have this special point z here. Now, z is being chosen in such a way that z lies in the intersection of future light cone of x and future light cone of y. Uh, this special choice is the way through which the causality as an equivalence relationship comes out in this. Uh, <coughs> Basically, what it means is that x, y influence the point z, but since z is in future and the light rays, I just explained to you the Zolfri metric. So, Zolfri metric is coming in over here. What is happening is this light ray is going out like that. It is going to circle the complete S3 universe and it is going to come back from this point over here. Similarly, this light ray is starting from here. It's going to circle the complete S3 universe in a single time cycle, and it's going to come back from over here. So, if you have S2, right, uh, then or a two sphere, then you can circle it along the the great circle, which is your longest path. But you can also circle it around any arbitrary set of smaller circles and come back to the point. So, with this viewpoint, is it uh, flexible enough to say, well, it doesn't have to always go on the great circle. It could go on any one of a, a set of smaller circles and That's still right. do the same thing. If we, accelerate, if we accelerate the particle, it can go on a smaller circle. 
but if we leave it free, it's going on a geodesic, no force is acting oh, on it. Right. Then it will take the longest uh -huh. circle. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so the light rays, they are moving on null geodesics, they call. Like time-like geodesics, they stay within the light cone. Space-like geodesics, they are tachyonic faster than light. They come out of the light cone. And the light rays, they are light-like and they stay on these, the surface of the light cones. <clears throat> so, if y was in the light cone of x, the way z is, we would have had influence of x going to y straight away. But now, y is on the space-like hypersurface, there is no light signal connecting the two. But there is a light signal going from x to z. And from z, it circles all the way back in. So, the past light cone of z is going like that. Past light cone of z is having both x and y. <coughs> so, here we have the first statement, z is the element of future light cone of x, intersection future light cone of y. So, from z, the signal can come and influence y. So, the signal goes from x to y via point z. Is this point clear? Uh, signal goes from x to z, there is no problem because z is in the light cone of x. Now, signal goes from y to z, no problem because z is in again light cone of y. Uh, this equation over here, simple equation here, z is the intersection of positive light cone of x and uh, future light cone of x rather, future light cone of y. Now, the past and future light cones in the Zolfi metric, they become identical. Just take a look at these three equations. Past light cone of, future light cone of x is equivalent to past light cone of x. Future light cone of y is equivalent to past light cone of y. Future light cone of z is equal to past light cone of z. The reason, the rays they go out, circle the universe, come back over here. Similarly, this ray goes out circles the universe and comes back over here. So, past and future light cone, they are connected. They are actual, actually one. They are not two different cones. It is actually one single cone. Right. Is that clear? Is there some antipodal point? Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes. Where, you kind of see this diagram in reverse. The cone goes out and it expands and it comes back. Like. That is right, that is right. In fact, the advanced waves and the retarded waves, we are going to consider like this interpreted here in this manner only. The waves, the retarded waves, the ones going to future, they go along this light cone. And the advanced waves, they are actually the retarded waves only coming back via this light cone. Is this point coming clear? Yeah? All right. <coughs> Any question? Yeah, it's not totally clear for me. So, what is the point exactly here? Uh, yeah, point is we want to show that there can be a signal going from x to y, even though they are on a space like hypersurface. Mm -hmm. How do we influence point x from point y? Ah, okay. How do we send that influence? comes from the Z, yeah. seen from the past. Yeah, hmm. because X and Y both can influence Z, and but because we have Zolfi metric, the light cones of past and future are identical, so the signal from Z comes back to X and Y. So the signal from X to Y, it does not go straight over here like this. First it goes to Z and then circles the universe around the S1 time and then comes back and affects Y. Yeah, it's clear now? Okay. Okay, so here we are at the advanced waves. Now, this is the mystery. Uh, we have the wave equation. Uh, we have second derivative of time here, second derivative of distance here. And we have the general solution f x minus c t g x plus c t, which is retarded component plus advanced component. 
Now, this advanced component is uh, neglected, it is not, uh, not seen, we do not see the advanced component. Retarded component, what does it mean? That light is coming from the bulb, that is the retarded waves. Advanced wave says, ki not only we have the light coming from the bulb, there should be light going towards the bulb. And that should happen before you switch on the switch. But we do not see that happening, so we say, okay, that is the time asymmetry, the advanced waves, they are not real. But let us think about it, uh, let us consider if supposing we, when we switch on the bulb, we have light rays coming towards it, but we have in between matter screening it, we have air, we have dust, we have a room, we have a house and nothing from outside external can go to the light bulb. But supposing we have a light bulb in space, let us say we have sun and around it there is just space, nothing blocking what is coming to it. Then maybe do we have advanced waves coming back to the sun? <coughs> well, in the Zollfree metric, we interpreted the advanced waves as retarded waves come circling the universe and coming back to the origin. So, advanced waves were nothing but retarded waves circling around and coming back. And then we have uh, interpretation of advanced waves. So, here you have a bulb, you have outgoing retarded waves and we are having incoming retarded waves and the mystery is what is happening to these advanced waves, why do not we see them? All right. So, here we come to the paradoxes of the sun. Now, sun is a special light source, it is unlike any light source which we uh, humans have made it here. It's it's there in the outer space. There's nothing around it. Nothing to block incoming waves or outgoing waves. So the solar corona paradox. Now this is photograph of a solar eclipse when the sun's disk completely or uh, the moon's disk completely blocks the sun. Now photosphere temperature of the sun is 6,000 degree Kelvin. But the surprise is the corona, the atmosphere of the sun which is seen in a solar eclipse or in certain instruments called coronagraphs. Uh, the coronal temperature measured is one and half million degree centigrade. Just look at the difference of order of magnitude here and here. So, this is one of the big mysteries of the sun, why the outside the atmosphere of the sun is so hot, whereas the surface temperature is just 6000 degrees. And of course, the calculated core temperature is 15 million if there are nuclear actions going on at the center. Okay, then you have second solar paradox. Uh, is that calculate? So, can you flip back to the previous slide? So, it is not measured, it is a theoretical temperature. The outer temperature is measured, mm -hmm. the inner temperature is not measured. Yeah. And the, the um, theory of the inner temperature, is this based this uh, based on um, classic physics or does it fully incorporate quantum mechanics? Uh, this 15 this, million degree? Yes. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, involves the, we have the gravitational force and we have the fusion of the hydrogen into helium, the basic reaction and the, it is only the gravitational pressure which is coming into, the nuclear reaction as such is described uh, quantum mechanically, mm -hmm. but the force that is gravitational only. Okay. So, right. Yes. I understand they use quantum tunneling to model the fusion, like in other words, the fusion that occurs cannot occur without quantum mechanics, quantum tunneling. Yeah. Should I continue? Alright, so this is the second solar paradox, solar neutrinos. Now, as Cleve was mentioning, we have theoretical models of uh, how the nuclear reactions occur at sun's core. There are different types of models and they give different predictions for the amount of neutrinos and other particles, photons which should be produced. 
I thought that they measured the radiation and, and then they deduce what is happening inside, right? Uh, uh, what is happening inside is, well, they try to adjust certain parameters of the model which is working inside yeah. from the radiation. Yeah. <coughs> Wait, from the relate. Well, Fong's asking that the 15 million Kelvin, she's saying, is that deduced from the outside temperature? I think not. I think it's deduced by a model. So they take yeah, the volume. Yeah, it is a model. I'm not talking yeah. about temperature. I'm talking about the, from the radiation you have. You measure all these gamma rays or these uh, different kind of particles, and from these, you kind of make a model like what's happening inside. If it's a what kind of nuclear reaction is happening, and then you you right. calculate the temperature. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the parameter of observations they do go into the model that the surface brightness is this much. So what must be the temperatures inside? What must be the right model inside? The radius of sun is this much, the mass of the sun is this much. So what is the gravitational force at the core, the pressures at the core? So all those things, they go into the model. Uh, but this temperature of 15 million Kelvin, it is a estimate from the model. It is not a measurement. This coronal temperature, 1.5 million, it's a measurement. And this photosphere temperature, it's a black body peaking at 6,000 degree Kelvin. That's also a measurement. But this is a estimate, theoretical estimate. <clears throat> so this model, the model for what's happening at the core, it predicts a certain quantity of solar neutrinos to be observable on Earth. And what is being observed is about one third of what should be coming from the sun. So we have these different types of neutrinos. We have the electron neutro, neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. So there's this theory that the neutrons, neutrinos can be converted into each other. So the theory, explanation for the neutrinos is the general presently accepted conventional interpretation is that the original electron neutrinos are being converted into the two other types and so we have one third of the what is uh, expected. Uh, but that explanation, it makes the neutrino ma massive. As such, we accept that neutrino is massless and it is traveling at speed of light. Uh, but this theory of conversion of uh, neutrino, it's called neutrino oscillation from one neutrino to another. That theory makes the elect a neutron massive. It makes it slower than light and it is in conflict with the standard model of particle physics. So we have a question mark here, which is not gone fully as yet. Is there, um, so, um, so I understand that the standard model uh, says that the neutrino is massless, but uh, in recent years, stronger experimental evidence is very convincing that shows that it's massive, which means that the standard model is wrong in this regard, right? Yeah. Uh, how, what is the quality of this experimental evidence? Uh, I'm not very familiar with the, that, those experiments, I've not studied them properly. Uh, but uh, what I recall was uh, there were papers uh, talking about 17 keV neutrino, uh, ma estimate of mass of the neutrino. There were some estimates, but I'm not uh, conversant with them now. Uh, then you have another paradox. In the corona, that electric atmosphere of the sun, you have the ions. You have ions of you have the ions of iron with up to 13 electrons removed, 12 electrons removed. And you have the spectral lines from those ions which show that the so many 13 or 12 electrons have been removed. And that is one way of estimating the temperature of the corona. Then you have the broadening of spectral lines. Uh, it's a Doppler broadening because the atoms and ions are moving very fast. So the spectral lines, according to the Doppler effect, it widens. And then you have the brightness of the, due to the electrons. So there is factor two discrepancy occurring over there. 
the equations uh, which uh, describe those uh, are of two type one in which you have equilibrium between the ions and electrons and another in which you do not have equilibrium between the two. So, there is a factor of two difference between these two approaches which is also not explained. Uh, so, this is my favorite figure. This is the sun as I understand it. We have the photosphere 6000 degrees. We have the solar corona. There are actually holes in the corona. I will show you in the photograph. Uh, you can see the small, small like there is a hole here. It depends but very from time to time there is a small hole here. Uh, now, why the holes are there that is not understood. Then there are streamers okay, like ribbons coming out or ribbons going in. The streamers, the streamers are not understood. Why the holes are there? They are not understood. Oh, it's, uh, it's magnetic. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There could be many explanations. Well, the explanation which I am trying to give here is um, the advanced phase for the sun. We have the outgoing retarded wave radiation from the sun, photosphere at 6,000 degree. We have the ions of iron at 12 and 13 electrons removed. And we have corona at the temperature of 1.5 million Kelvin. So, the solution which I propose for all the problems is that the outgoing fluxes from the sun, they are interacting with the returning fluxes and making the photosphere hotter and explaining other things. So the, the idea is that for the photosphere, the temperature comes from the black body uh, yeah. measurement, but the corona, this is made of uh, uh, plasma of very, uh, with very, very high uh, voltage, yeah. uh, ion plasma, yeah. uh, and uh, then this is a this comes from electromagnetic phenomena, as Dugan said, uh, and this is a temperature that we can also have here in the thunder, things like that. So it, it's really not related to the same kind of physics, these two different temperatures. Yeah. And photosphere is something global, probably in the volume. Yeah. And uh, in the corona, it's uh, in a very small filament, and it's linked to the a concentration of this ion and it's a kind of uh, extended uh, ohm effect in fact with some resistance with very very high tension and so it gives heat and uh, locally very high uh, temperature. Well the high temperature in the plasma does not mean it's actually really hot you don't feel it hot like in the bowel. All oh, right. It's because yes. it's low density. So the, hmm. the particle moves super fast, that's why the temperature is super high. But the, when you really touch it, it does not really, you don't Because it's very small. <laughs> yeah. Locally it's hot, but it's so small that it cannot yeah, it's uh, very touch you. And you have touched this plasma? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> she was in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Low temperature plasma I worked before, and they high, high temperature plasmas. Low temperature plasmas are like yeah you don't feel at all but but that low temperature does not mean like cold low it's relatively low relatively yes it's a yeah. uh, so the thesis which i am projecting here is that advanced waves are real and they are having an impact on the solar physics and the various parameters which we associate with the sun will be influenced by the advanced incoming radiation Sun is there out in the outer space. It's not surrounded by anything which is blocking the advanced waves, the way the advanced waves get blocked in our room or in our atmosphere. So this is uh, the best I got. And at <coughs> uh, this point, I just decided to mention it later. Uh, the Siegel, he's written a book called Mathematical Astronomy and uh, extra galactic mathematical cosmology and extra galactic astronomy. On he's tried to interpret all cosmological and astrophysical data in terms of uh, this topology of space time. Now, the topology of space time, 
in quantum mechanics we have the energy operator d by dt. So, when the time is s 1 uh, this operator gets modified and it is got a epsilon term here d t and another epsilon inverse. So, the energy operator gets modified and as a result of which uh, the energy which is being measured over large cosmological scales that gets modified and it gives a different and redshift relationship for the distant quasars. Quasars are among the more distant objects and their redshift are very high. The nearby galaxies their redshift is low, uh, but quasars are object in very distant galaxies and the redshift relation normally is considered linear you have z here, you have distance d here and you have the Hubble's parameter h. <coughs> so, in Siegel's model uh, he has got data points, actual data points measured experimentally going. So, he finds that a, the curve goes like this something like tan s instead of uh, having a re linear relationship. Uh, just the factor h appearing z is equal to d h, we are having z is equal to tan s also s here h s. So, Siegel shows lot of comparisons he does figure he gives, I should have brought slides for that, I did not bring them, did not occur to me. So, the redshift of distant quasars is uh, another point uh, to support uh, this thesis. Uh, yes, then the solution to the EPR paradox, this is similar to the figure I made earlier, only this is in 2D. The signal goes from point x to point y through intermediate point z. Now, somehow the z becomes a special point. If we did not have the z over here, we would not have the causal relationship going from x to y. So, points like z, there could be a unique z for the whole universe or there could be different uh, z, sorry that is the pronunciation you use z for z, back here in India we use z. So, there is z is a special point. Uh, which is playing a role in EPR and otherwise it is the circular topology of both space and time factors. Okay. <coughs> uh, this is something uh, interesting and uh, while I was just uh, a graduate student, I was trying out various metrics which would give closed geodesics that the particles they travel around and come back to the starting point because Minkowski universe they just keep going straight, they never come back and all other space time also that is the situation. Uh, so, this is just the Minkowski metric. Now, we make the simple replacement t goes to type sin t, we put t by pi here and another t here. So, t is element of minus t to t, this is periodic in 2t, this function. Now, I plug it that term in the matrix and I get Minkowski matrix with this modification for the time term. So, it turns out it is Ricci flat, the Riemann curvature tensor vanishes, the Ricci vanishes, the Ricci scalar vanishes. So, it turns out this is a vacuum solution just like Minkowski space time. And when we integrate the geodesic equations for this and solve for the spatial coordinates, we get a equation like this over here. So, this is the initial position, there is the amplitude. So, the particles they oscillate like a wave, like pendulum. Simple cases instead of going in a straight line, they just oscillate 
in one oscillation per period or it could be two oscillations per period. But more than that, the particles can move on what is called as lissagious figures. They could go complicated oscillations they would do. These parameters which specify which how many oscillations, what is the phase, all that comes from this equation. You have, the, you have complete freedom of how many nodes you want, how much amplitude you want. All those comes through constants of the geodesic equation, the initial conditions. You can do something irrational with the, so it fills up the, the diagram? Uh, irrational, you mean the number, irrational number? Yeah, so those are, you know, irrational, mm -hmm. irrational things. Uh, well, if you change, basically Lissajous figures, people study in uh, electrical engineering, one of the first things they study. Uh, when you have, let's say, a wave, sine wave in x direction, and you have a sine wave in y direction, and you add up the two waves, then it describes curves like these. Yes, when, yeah, when you have a sign. rational between the two frequencies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what, what are the frequency in the? <coughs> Anything, it comes from the initial condition. Uh, this, this term, nu by t. Nu is nu by t is frequencies cycles per universal period. So it's actually a constant going into the equations. It can have any value. It's part of the initial condition. You could have a particle making two oscillations in a single period, okay. or one oscillation in a single time it period. Be uh, nu by t. T is the time period. Yes, nu, nu, by nu can be an integer. T is the time period of the universe. So this gives the initial location, the initial position where the particle is there. This AI gives the amplitude, how large is the equation. And o, phi gives the phase of the oscillation. All these numbers, AI, nu, phi, and xi0, they turn out as constants which when we integrate the geodesic equations. All right, so this is Ockham's razor. So here I am applying Ockham's razor, a solution which solves the largest set of problems with minimal assumptions is likely to be the right solution. And this is the list of problems we have addressed, advanced waves, EPR paradox, the three solar paradoxes, and the redshift of distance causes. And the assumptions we are making is the S3 cross S1 topology of space time. Now, these problems, they belong to different realms. They cut across various subsets of uh, the study of physics, uh, and we are applying a single idea for them. Uh, now, this is one of my favorite figures, uh, choice and the graph of the multinos. If time is S1, that means repetition of events in identical cycles, then we are not having choice in S1 time. Because whatever action we are doing here now, same action we did in the last cycle. So we don't have a choice now. And we're going to do the same thing in the future cycle also. So the choice is running out in S1 time, which is not very uh, uh, entertaining thing to happen. And so I made this diagram that you have a multiverse in which some universes, they are time cyclic, some universes, they are linear, the main branch, some universes, the time branches off, and it can go straight or it can come back and join the main branch, or the universe can branch from here and go into a time loop, or from a time loop, it would come out and join the main branch. There could be island universes in which the time just moves in a circle. So. What is the topology of universe we are living in? What would be the consciousness and its choices in a multiverse? The freedom and choices would exist in branches with open linear time. This picture actually I saw in a dream. I have used to wonder about the choices of time and this picture I saw in a dream, in meditate. So that's about all, thank you.